did you ever hear or discover something so great and so impressive that you just couldn't wait to tell others about it? Hi, I'm Robert Darnell, and like most of you, I've often wondered about things. Yes, I wondered because, as you know, it says there is nothing new under the sun. But wait, what about telephones and microwave ovens and automobiles and the space shuttle? Aren't all these things new? But you say wait, and I agree with you. It does say there is nothing new under the sun. Seems confusing, yes? But probably like you, I had decided to live with it. Well, like it also says, all things work together for those who love the Lord. And one Saturday, in the spring of 1990, my wife and I were having the typical spring garage sale. And this is when and where I met Dr. Noah Fredericks. We got into a conversation, and he told me that for the past 25 years he had studied the Word. Well, I immediately thought, oh no, another fanatic pulpit founder. As I pulled out my mental six-gun, which was fully loaded, with the five or six stock questions of wonderment that no one had ever been able to dodge or give me any type of any acceptable answer to. Yes, these questions had never failed in sending the so-called or self-proclaimed studied down the road talking to themselves. You see, I don't believe that God is the author of confusion, and I had some real points I'd been confused about. And I had kept myself rid of these Bible thumpers by demanding not only real but also understandable answers that really made good sense. Well, I was going to get rid of this one quick. So I nailed him with five or six questions. And he just smiled the most sincere and confident smile I'd ever seen on any face in all of my life. And ever so calmly, he asked me, Do you really want to know these things? Hey, now I won't kid you. This really shocked me. No one else had ever had any reply. But was he bluffing? So I told him, Sure, let's go in and sit down. Just knowing he would say something like, Uh, oh, uh, well, I haven't got the time, uh, now, but, uh, uh, oh, maybe later we can do it later. You know, something like that. But you know what? This was not to be the case. Five hours later, all of my questions not only were answered, but each answer was more than proven and backed up with proof upon proof, fact upon fact, and, yes, Scripture upon Scripture. Okay, but who is Noah Fredericks? Well, I feel this question can best be answered by Mr. Mike Brown, who has been Noah's best friend for more than 20 years. Mike is an advisor and consultant to many of the best attorneys and law firms in the nation, and has written several books on not only the law, but also the Samson Diet and Development Program used by muscle builders weightlifters and Olympians all over the world and Mike also produces those high mileage carburetors you've heard of and is currently reproducing the very first privately produced English translation of the Bible ever printed some 400 years ago and that's not all Mike will impress you with his understanding and use of the Chinese Russian and Hebrew languages and he also has a college degree and is certified in electronics and holds an FCC license. Plus, his college and formal training expands into and includes chemistry, power mechanics, and the liberal arts. Yes, this is the same Mike Brown you've probably seen on any of several TV shows and heard on radio talk shows, coast to coast, border to border, and then some. Or you've read his famous articles that regularly appear in leading newspapers and magazines. So don't be surprised when you recognize his voice. And now, I give you Mr. Mike Brown. Thank you, Robert. Yes, I met Noah Fredericks over 20 years ago. At the time, I was what you would call an agnostic. 
An agnostic is somebody who says, oh God, if there is a God, save my soul if I have a soul. Uh, at the age of 25, when I met Noah, I had never read a Bible in my entire life. Uh, he introduced me to uh, not only the Bible, but the Strong's Analytical Concordance, to various study aids, and with what he taught me, I was able to discover within less than a two-year period how Samson actually got his strength. He was genetically programmed. It's right there in Judges 13, if you care to read it. He was programmed through diet while his, even before his mother conceived him. Uh, I was able to see, based on the things that Noah Frederick had taught me as far as study goes, I was able to see the geographical advantage that allowed Samson to slay a thousand Philistines at once. It had nothing to do with what you see in the Victor Mature movies. It was more like he was standing on a mountain range, on the spine of a mountain range, and when he hit the first Philistine, uh, a lot of them just went over like dominoes. You can see that yourself in the uh, chapter of Judges where it describes the geographical location where he was facing, if you get a map out and compare it. I learned all this from Noah Fredericks, probably the most brilliant Bible scholar of the 20th century and possibly for centuries into the past. The mere things that he taught me uh, have allowed me to write several books. Samson wasn't the only one on the Bible. I would like to explain a few things about language. All of us think we are familiar with language. Our own language, some of us have had training in foreign languages. My training is in Hebrew, Chinese, and Russian. Uh, however, what you have to be careful of, and this is true of all languages, is that all languages have sublanguages. For example, in the English language, our sublanguages are based in three different groups. You'll also find this true of Russian, uh, Chinese, and it's true of Hebrew, though nobody has recognized it for over 2,000 years. The first is, is that in the use of language, we have our everyday speech. In other words, if you say in Russian, I want some water, and you translate that into English, and you translate that into Chinese, and you translate that into Hebrew, the meaning is perfectly clear. You will lose nothing. However, there are idiomatic expressions. This is the second basic uh, sub-language that you have in any spoken language. But the third and the most important subgroup, or whatever you want to call it, of any language is the technical expressions. Now, as an illustration of the sublanguage or the, the technical uh, aspect of a language, let's take the field of electronics. For example, a conductor in, ele in electronics means, or in electricity, this, the study of electricity is the transmission of power, electronics is the radio wave transmission of information. A conductor in, in electronics or electricity is normally a wire that carries electricity along it. However, in our everyday speech, a conductor is somebody who runs a subway or a train or a trolley car or something like that. The meanings are not the same. They're similar, but they're not the same. Now, there's one more thing we have to discuss with languages here, and this is what quite often causes people to think of the Bible as a fairy tale. Not only do you have to translate it from one language to another, but even in our own language, words change meaning. For example, there's a passage in the Bible where King Hezekiah says, I prevented the dawn of the morning. Now, you and I can't do that. Neither could he. The reason is, is that in 1611 and before, when the King James Bible was translated, prevented meant anticipated had a completely different meaning over three centuries ago. I want you to imagine yourself as a survivor of an intergalactic war far away in another galaxy on another planet. And the only thing that you are allowed to take with you from this experience is a book. However, after this intergalactic war in another galaxy, I want you to also imagine that you and the people with you, or your ancestors, built a movable sta space station and moved it into another galaxy. And while on this space station, you or your ancestors misbehaved. And as a consequence, you or your ancestors were kicked out of this particular space station and literally dumped in a wilderness as a penal colony. Now, 
Let's take this one step further. Let's say that the book that you were kicked into this penal colony with, and we're talking about uh, just setting down with one book of written instructions, a few tools, and you're right, you're out there, and you're out there in the wilderness. I mean, there's, uh, you've got to build a civilization from scratch. And this particular book tells you how to live. It gives you rules for diet. It gives you rules for government. It pretty well tells you how to behave yourself so life isn't too difficult. And this book, because it's in English, and it's taken over by, let's say you and your, your ancestors are taken over by another superior civilization in armaments and weapons. Let's say it was the Soviet Union. Let's say the Soviet Union came in here and uh, we all wound up speaking Russian. Well, and obviously our book's going to have to be translated into Russian. It has, Russian is a different alphabet from ours. And the fact is, is that since our book does concern some technical terms, such as in electronics, and the people doing the translating don't have sufficient training in electronics, what is going to happen is that when this book gets translated from English into Russian, a lot of the technical terms are going to get pretty well fouled up. The words will be there, but the meaning may be lost, just as in conductor, uh, as in other technical terms. Now, once civilization has decayed, and you can see this in any anthropology class or uh, any sociology class, once a civilization decays, you, you always have superstition arising and you wind up with a priest class. And let's say that after we've translated this book from English into Russian, and we have this priest uh, caste that arises, even though our book describes quite plainly uh, in English, and the ones who originally had it knew it, it describes aircraft and electronics, these priests in a, in a civilization that's decayed, that have never seen a television set, that have never seen an airplane, uh, that have never seen anything that the book describes, well, obviously they have to start interpreting it. And quite often they will interpret it in order to control men's minds. Now, you can see how readily this would, uh, situation would arise because if you had a priest class whose entire scientific knowledge was limited to the ox cart and the bow and arrow, uh, you can see, you can see uh, without me being too redundant here, immediately what would happen. Now, as civilization progresses back up, as it normally does, uh, civilization has, seems to have peaks and valleys, uh, eventually you're going to have a rebellion against the priests when the common people begin to study the book and they say, wait a minute, I don't think it says what these priests say it says. And so pretty soon you have two groups of people. You have people saying the book says this and you have people saying the book says that. And now. The problem is, again, is that a civilization is rising, even though this book describes aircraft and electronics, if the people who disagreed with the priest are limited to the technical knowledge, uh, say the epitome of their civilization is the musket and the sailing ship, obviously there are going to be concepts there that they simply do not understand. They do not have what is called a frame of reference. If you have someone who's never seen something, obviously he can't relate to it got no way to refer to it. He has no frame of reference. Now, the other problem you have is that and the priests have been overcome, then the people who overcame them, when they start dealing with this book, they're going to have the same mindset or the same frame of reference as the people who had the musket and the sailing ship. They won't go forward from there. They'll just keep retranslating the same words over and over from the English into the Russian not realizing that they missed something. The original Hebrew language became a dead language four centuries before the birth of Christ. Now the Hebrew language has no vowels. It's written from right to left, and it does not have what we call vowels. Those marks that you see over, above, and in between the Hebrew letters were not put in there until over a thousand years later by the Masoretic scholars about the ninth century AD. Those people had no frame of reference that would apply to what Noah Fredericks is about to teach you. Their technology was limited to the ox cart and the bow and arrow. But there hasn't been any great disagreement among people as to what the book says because the people translating the Bible today have a frame of reference that belongs in the 17th century. Noah Fredericks is the first one to come along in, in centuries 
to take a look at it and wait a minute, it doesn't say this. We have a better frame of reference to compare it to. Nobody even knew what electricity was, and they, they certainly had not seen an airplane. They simply had not had the frame of reference. Let me close this and introduce Noah Fredericks to you with these words out of the book of Daniel, chapter 12, verse 9. And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. What you are about to hear is the opening and unsealing of those words.